This video is going to be all about the rules for the biconditional. So we'll do biconditional introduction, biconditional elimination, and take a look at proofs that use those. And typically, proofs with biconditionals can be a little bit more complicated. They don't all have to be, but typically if you see a biconditional in a proof, that means that there's typically more lines than the other proofs. So remember, biconditional basically means that if we have P, if and only if Q, then P and Q have the same value. So if P is true, Q is true. If P is false, then Q is false. So what this means in terms of an actual proof is that if we assume P and we get to Q, so if we get P arrow Q, and if at some point we prove that if we have Q, then we get P, well, the biconditional is just the arrow going in both directions. So if we have both of these being true, then we're going to get that P is the same as Q. So in line M here, we would be able to write P if and only if Q. Now to justify this, we'd say, well, we have a proof from I to J that if P then Q. We have a proof from line K to L that if we have Q then P. And this is just the biconditional introduction. So that's how we can use biconditional introduction in our proofs. So in a way, it's kind of like or elimination in that you're making two subproofs. That's sort of how it is, but we don't need an initial assumption here. We can just assume P at any time, we can assume Q at any time, and as long as we can get that each of them prove each other, then that means that P and Q are essentially the same. Elimination is a little bit more straightforward. So same idea, if P is the same as Q, then if we have P, we are able to get Q out of it. This is just like modus ponens in both directions. So we have P arrow Q, we have Q arrow P, therefore if we have P, we get Q. Uh, it's the same thing with the bottom one. P if and only if Q, we have Q, well, therefore we have P. So both of these, we could write uh, I to J, or I could just write not I to J, but I and J gives us K, and this was biconditional elimination. So same thing for both. And before we move on, I want to show why this works. So if we were to do a proof, like let's say that we have a proof. Uh, let's sort of start one here. We won't be too neat about this, so line I, we just assume that we have P if and only of Q. Well, in line two, if we just use the definition of the biconditional, this is what we get. So this is line one, and this is the definition of the biconditional, P arrow Q and Q arrow P. So in line three and four, if we use conjunction elimination on line two, well, we get P arrow Q and Q arrow P. So at some point later, let's say in line I, if we have P, then yeah, we're going to get Q in the next line because we could use 3 and I and use modus ponens. If some point we have, say, line K, we have Q, well then in K plus 1, we can get P because we can use 4 and K and modus ponens. So this is sort of what's happening here with the biconditional elimination. So sometimes you have to prove this one before you can use it. Well, it would look very similar to how this one looks on the right. Just whatever your assumption with P or Q is, you'd put them up in the assumptions at the top. Okay, let's do a couple examples. So the first one, I want to show that A arrow B and B arrow C. C arrow A means that A if and only if C. So let's turn on our lines and do a proof. So I have two assumptions. Let's start with those in yellow, one and two. Uh, we have A arrow B, and we have B arrow C, and then we have C arrow A. Okay, so these are all conditionals, which is unfortunate because this means we're going to have to introduce some subproofs to do anything. So we want to prove A if and only if C. So what this means is that we have to start with A, and we have to find that we get C, and we have to start with C, and then we have to find that we get A. That's our, that's our strategy here. So before we do that, what I'm going to do is in line 3 and 4, I'm going to use AND elimination on line 1, so we can separate both of these for eventual modus ponens use. 
So both of these were line one and elimination. Okay, at this point we can start a subproof. So I'm going to start my first one with A. And with this we have to prove C. So this is a hypothesis, and I could write that I want to do biconditional introduction just to keep track of why I'm doing this. Okay, so I'm going to reiterate a couple of these lines. I'm going to reiterate A arrow B and B arrow C. So this was from line three and line four because I want to use these in the subproof. So in line eight, I have A and A arrow B. So this gives me B. So this was five, six, and modus ponens. And then in line nine, I'm going to use B arrow C and B to get C. So that's from line seven and eight. And that is also modus ponens. So if we assume A, then we get C. So we've essentially done A arrow C here. Now what we have to do is we have to do C arrow A. So we'll start a new subproof, assuming C. So there's our assumption. In fact, I don't think I need that many lines. I think I just need three here. So I'm going to reiterate C arrow A. This is from line two. I should probably write that this is a new hypothesis too, and let's just do biconditional introduction just to write why we're doing the assumption. So from line two, I've reiterated C arrow A into line 11. At this point in line 12, I can just do modus ponens. I have C, I have C arrow A, therefore I can get A out of it. So this was 10, 11 modus ponens. Now at this point, I've shown that if I have A, then I have C. And if I have C, then I have A. So in line 13, I can now introduce A if and only if C. This is the biconditional introduction. So from lines 5 to 9, I have the subproof of A arrow C. From lines 10 to 12, I have the subproof of C arrow A. And this is just the biconditional introduction. So this is the proof that shows that A arrow B and B arrow C, along with C arrow A, gives us A if and only if C. So that is example one. Let's look at example two. Let's show that A if and only if not B and C. C if and only if not B and not D gives us A and not D. So this one probably be a little bit of work. Let's see what we can do here. So we have two assumptions. Let's write those out in lines one and line two. A if and only if not B and C. C if and only if not B. Should make sure I get this right, otherwise the entire thing is not gonna work and not D. These are our two hypotheses. Okay, I'm just gonna use and elimination on one and two to separate everything into their components. So that way we can start working with things. So I'll do this in light blue, why not? So we're going to get A if and only if not B and C. Uh, these both come from one and elimination. And then in lines five and six, I want to get C if and only if not B, and then not D, and this comes from line two, and elimination. So now we have things we can work with. Okay, well, here's something that's nice. In line four, I have C, and in line five, I have C if and only if not B. Well, we know C is the same thing as not B, so in line seven, we can use biconditional elimination to get us not B. So this comes from lines four and lines five, and this is by conditional elimination. Okay, that was convenient. And it's convenient because now in line eight, well, what do I need to get? I need to get A and not D. Well, I have not B, and I say that A if and only if not B. This is super convenient because I can use by conditional elimination on line three using line seven in order to get A out of it, because it follows the pattern. I have not B, I have A if and only if not B, so not B is the same thing as A, so we can write it down. At this point, well, I just have one more step. Turns out I didn't really need all my lines here, which is fantastic. So line nine, uh, I have A, I have not D, so line six and line eight. So I can use conjunction introduction to get A and not D. So this comes from six, this comes from eight, 
and this is conjunction, introduction, and therefore the proof is complete. So actually, this looked a little scary at first when I first started it, but given the assumptions that we had, C and not D, we were able to use C to give us pretty much everything we need, and not D came for free with one of our initial assumptions. So this actually wasn't bad in the end. Now, at this point, you should be able to do these two proofs. And these are a little bit more complicated than the ones we just did, but you follow the same strategies. You follow the same assumptions. So, for instance, in the first one, you have to prove that if you have R, then you have Q and not P. So assume R and see what happens with your assumptions. In, now so basically you're doing R and you're trying to get Q and not P in the end. That's the goal. With two, well, you have to find P if and only if Q. So you have to assume P, get Q, and then you have to assume Q and get P, and then you can introduce it with biconditional introduction. So you can post your comment, your answers in the comments below. It's probably difficult to do, uh, but if you have any questions, you can post those in the comments below and I'll answer those when I can.